大家好啊，读你听嘅时间。咁啊，上一回就十七节 ，Four Fifty from Paddington。OK， 阿拉克里斯嘅讲紧呢个查案啊，吓 credit 咧不断喺度查案，搜集口供。向呢個 Doctor Quimper 咧攞到少少資訊啦，佢對於 c r a c k i n g f o r Family 嘅睇法啦，同埋就係咧呢個小主人啊 Alexander 同埋佢朋友咧，佢哋揾到線索喎，佢哋揾到一封信喎，咁個信入面就係寫就係俾呢個 Martin 嘅 Martin c r a c k i n g f o r 嘅，咁但係就未鑑定嘅，咁啊又多啲線索。咁啊，案情就繼續咧，就曲折離奇落去啦。咁呢一節第十八啦，我哋睇下咧 ，Credit 咧會唔會揾翻 Miss Marple， 又或者會揾到啊 Cedric 啊，繼續落口供啊。OK， Chapter Eighteen。Credit was escorted by the boys through the back door into the house. This was, it seemed, their common mode of entrance. The kitchen was bright and cheerful. Lucy, in a large white apron, was rolling out pastry. Leaning against the dresser, watching her with a kind of dog-like attention, was Brian Easley. With one hand, he tugged at his large fair moustache. "Hello, Dad," said Alexander kindly. "You out here again?" "I like it out here," said Brian, and added, "Miss Eyesbarrow doesn't mind." "Oh, I don't mind," said Lucy. "Good evening, Inspector Craddock." "Coming to detect in the kitchen?" asked Brian with interest. "Not exactly." Mr. Cedric Crackenthorp is still here, isn't he? Oh yes, Cedric's here. Do you want him? I'd like a word with him. Yes, please. I'll go and see if he's in," said Brian. He may have gone round to the local. He unpropped himself from the dresser. Thank you so much," said Lucy to him. "My hands are all over flour, or I'd go." "What are you making?" asked Stoddard West anxiously. "Peach flan." "Good old," said Stoddard West. Is it nearly supper time? Asked Alexander. No. Gosh, I'm terribly hungry. There's the end of the ginger cake in the larder. The boys made a concerted rush and collided in the door. They're just like locusts," said Lucy. "My congratulations to you," said Credit. "What on exactly? Your ingenuity over this? Over what?" Credit indicated the folder containing the letter. "Very nicely done," he said. "What are you talking about?" This, my dear girl. This, he half drew it out. She stared at him uncomprehendingly. Cradock felt suddenly dizzy. Didn't you fake this clue and put it in the boiler room for the boys to find? Quick, tell me. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about," said Lucy. "Do you mean that?" Cradock slipped the folder quickly back in his pocket as Brian returned. Cedric's in the library," he said. "Go on in." He resumed his place on the dresser. Inspector Craddock went to the library. Cedric Crackenthorpe seemed delighted to see the inspector. Doing a spot more sleuthing down here, he asked. Got any further? I think I can say we are a little further on, Mister Crackenthorpe. Found out who the corpse was. We've not got a definite identification, but we have a fairly shrewd idea. Good for you. Arising out of our latest information, we want to get a few statements. I'm starting with you, Mr. Crackenthorpe, as you are on the spot. I shan't be much longer. I'm going back to Ibiza in a day or two. Then I seem to be just in time. Go ahead. I should like a detailed account, please, of exactly where you were and what you were doing on Friday, twentieth December. Cedric shot a quick glance at him. Then he leaned back, yawned, assumed an air of great nonchalance, and appeared to be lost in the effort of remembrance. Well, as I have already told you, I was in the beach, sir. Trouble is, one day there is so like another. Painting in the morning, siesta from three p.m. to five, perhaps a spot of sketching in the light suitable, then an aperitif, sometimes with the mayor, sometimes with the doctor and the cafe in the piazza. After that, some kind of a scratch meal. Most of the evening in Scotty's bar with some of my lower class friends. Will that do you? I'd rather have the truth, Mr. Crackenthorpe. Cedric sat up. That's most offensive remark, Inspector. Do you think so? You told me, Mr. Crackenthorpe, that you left the beach zone on twenty-first December and arrived in England that same day. So I did. M. Hi, M. 
Emma Crackenthorpe came through the adjoining door from the small morning room. She looked inquiringly from Cedric to the inspector. Look here, Em. I arrived here for Christmas on the Saturday before, didn't I? Came straight from the airport. Yes, said Emma wonderingly. You got here about lunchtime. There you are, said Cedric to the inspector. You must think us very foolish, Mr. Crackenthorpe, said Cedric pleasantly. We can check on these things, you know. I think if you show me your passport, he paused expectantly. Can't find a damn thing," said Cedric. "Was looking for it this morning. Wanted to send it to Cooks. I think you could find it, Mister Crackenthorpe, but it's not really necessary. The records show that you actually entered this country on the evening of nineteenth December. Perhaps you will now account to me for your movements between the time until lunchtime on twenty-first December when you arrived here. Cedric looked very cross indeed. "What's the hell of life nowadays?" he said angrily. "All this red tape and form filling—that's what comes of a bureaucratic state. Can't go where you like and do as you please anymore. Somebody's always asking questions. What's all this fuss about the twentieth anyway? What's special about the twentieth? It happens to be the day we believe the murder was committed. You can refuse to answer, of course, but who says I refuse to answer? Give a chap time." And you were vague enough about the date of the murder at the inquest. What's turned up new since then? Cradock did not reply. Cedric said with a sidelong glance at Emma, "Shall we go into the other room?" Emma said quickly, "I'll leave you." At the door, she paused and turned. "This is serious, you know, Cedric. If the twentieth was the day of murder, then you must tell Inspector Cradock exactly what you were doing." She went through into the next room and closed the door behind her. Good old M," said Cedric. "Well, here goes. Yes, I left the beach on the nineteenth, all right. Plan to break the journey in Paris and spend a couple of days routing up some old friends on the left bank. But as a matter of fact, there was a very attractive woman on the plane. Quite a dish, to put it plainly. She and I got off together. She was on her way to the States. Had to spend a couple of nights in London to see about some business or other. We got to London on the nineteenth." We stay at the Kingsway Palace in case your spies haven't found that out yet. Call myself John Brown. Never does to use your own name on these occasions. And on the twentieth, Cedric made a grimace. Morning pretty well occupied by a terrific hangover, and the afternoon from three o'clock onwards. Let me see. Well, I mooned about, as you might say. Went to the National Gallery. That's respectable enough. Saw a film, Rwanda of the Range. I've always had a passion for westerns. This was a corker. Then a drink or two in the bar and a bit of a sleep in my room. And out about ten o'clock with the girlfriend and a round of various hot spots. Can't even remember most of their names. Jumping Frog was one, I think. She knew them all. Got pretty well plastered, and to tell the truth, don't remember much more until I woke up the next morning, with an even worse hangover. Girlfriend hopped off to catch a plane, and I poured cold water over my head. Got a chemist to give me a devil's brew, and then started off for this place. Pretending I just arrived at Heathrow, no need to upset Emma. I thought, you know what women are always hurt if you don't come straight home. I had to borrow money from her to pay the taxi. I was completely cleaned out. No use asking the old man; he'd never cough up. Me and old brutes. Well, Inspector, satisfied? Can any of this be substantiated? Did Mister Crackenthorpe say between three p.m. and seven p.m.? Most unlikely, I should think," said Cedric cheerfully. National Gallery, where the attendants look at you with lackluster eyes in a crowded picture show. No, not likely. Emma re-entered. She held a small engagement book in her hand. You want to know what everyone was doing on twentieth December? Is that right, Inspector Craddock? Well,、uh, yes, Miss Crackenthorpe. I've just been looking in my engagement book. On the twentieth, I went into Brackhampton to attend a meeting of the Church Restoration Fund. That finished about a quarter to one, and a lunch with Lady Addington and Miss Bartlett, who were also on the committee at the Cadena Cafe. After lunch, I did some shopping, stores for Christmas, and also Christmas presents. I went to Greenfords and Leo and Swifts Boots, and probably several other shops. I had tea about a quarter to five in the Shamrock Tea Rooms, and then went to the station to meet Brian, who was coming by train. I got home about six o'clock and found my father in a very bad temper. I had left lunch ready for him, but Mrs. Hart, who was to come in in the afternoon and give him his tea, had not arrived. He was so angry that he had shut himself in his room and would not let me in or speak to me. 
He does not like me going out in the afternoon, but I make a point of doing so now and then. You are probably wise. Thank you, Miss Crackenthorpe. He could hardly tell her that, as she was a woman, height five foot seven, her movements that afternoon were of no great importance. Instead, he said, "Your other two brothers came down later. I understand. Alfred came down late on Saturday evening. He tells me he tried to ring me on the telephone that afternoon I was out, but my father, he was upset, will never answer the phone. My brother Harold did not come down until Christmas Eve." Thank you, Miss Crackenthorpe. I suppose I mustn't ask. She hesitated. What has come up new that prompts these inquiries? Frederick took the folder from his pocket. Using the tips of his fingers, he extracted the envelope. Don't touch it, please. But do you recognize this? But Emma stared at him, bewildered. That's my handwriting. That's the letter I wrote to Martine. I thought it might be. But how did you get it? Did she? Have you found her? It would seem possible that we have found her. This empty envelope was found here, in the house, in the grounds. Then she did come here. She, you mean, it was Martine there in the sarcophagus? It would seem very likely, Miss Crackenthorpe said, rather gently. It seemed even more likely when he got back to town. A message was awaiting him from Armand Dessen. One of the girlfriends has had a postcard from Anna Stravinska. Apparently, the true story was true. She has reached Jamaica and is having, in your phrase, a wonderful time. Greta crumpled up the message and threw it into the waste paper basket. I must say, said Alexander, sitting up in bed, thoughtfully consuming a chocolate bar, that this has been the most smashing day ever. Actually, finding a real clue. His voice was awed. In fact, the whole holidays have been smashing. He added happily. I don't suppose such a thing will ever happen again. I hope it won't happen again to me, said Lucy, who was on her knees packing Alexander's clothes into a suitcase. Do you want all this space fiction with you? Not those two top ones. I've read them. The football and my football boots and the gum boots can go separately. More difficult things you boys to do travel with. It won't matter. They're sending the rolls for us. They've got a smashing rolls. They've got one of the new Mercedes Benzes too. They must be rich. Rolling, surely nice too. But all the same, I rather wish we weren't leaving here. Another body might turn up. I sincerely hope not. Well, it often does in books. I mean, somebody who's seen something or heard something gets done in too. It might be you," he added, and rolling a second chocolate bar. "Thank you. I don't want it to be you," Alexander assured her. "I think you very much, and so does Stoddis. We think you're out of this world as a cook. Absolutely lovely grub. You are very sensible too. This last was clearly an expression of high approval." Lucy took it as such and said, "Thank you, but I don't intend to get killed just to please you." Well, you'd better be careful then," Alexander told her. He paused to consume more nourishment and then said in a slightly offhand voice, "If Dad turns up from time to time, you look after him, won't you?" "Yes, of course," said Lucy, a little surprised. "The trouble with Dad is," Alexander informed her, "that London life doesn't suit him. He gets in, you know, with quite the wrong type of women." He shook his head in a worried manner. I'm very fond of him," he added, "but he needs someone to look after him. He drifts about and gets in with the wrong people. It's a great pity Mum died when she did. Brian needs a proper home life." He looked solemnly at Lucy and reached out for another chocolate bar. "Not a fourth one, Alexander," Lucy pleaded. "You'll be sick." "Oh, I don't think so. I had six running ones and I wasn't. I'm not the bilious type." He paused and then said, "Brian likes you, you know." That's very nice of him. He's a bit of an ass in some ways," said Brian's son. "But he was a jolly good fighter pilot. He's awfully brave, and he's awfully good-natured." He paused, then averting his eyes to the ceiling, he said rather self-consciously, "I think really, you know, it would be a good thing if he married again, somebody decent. I shouldn't myself mind at all having a stepmother. Not, I mean, if she was a decent sort." With a sense of shock, Lucy realized that there was a definite point in Alexander's conversation. All this stepmother bosh went on. Alexander, still addressing the ceiling, is really quite out of date. Lots of chaps' daughters and I know have stepmothers, divorce and all that, and they get on quite well together. Depends on the stepmother, of course. And of course, it does make a bit of confusion taking you out and on sports day and all that. I mean, if there are two sets of parents. Though again, it helps if you want to cash in. He paused, confronted with the problems of modern life. 
It's nicest to have your own home and your own parents. But if your mother's dead, well, you see what I mean. If she's a decent sort," said Alexander for the third time. Lucy felt touched. "I think you're very sensible, Alexander," she said. "We must try and find a nice wife for your father." "Yes," said Alexander noncommittally. He added in an offhand manner, "I thought I'll just mention it. Brian likes you very much. He told me so." "Really?" thought Lucy to herself. There's too much matchmaking round here. First Miss Marple and now Alexander. For some reason or other, pig styes came into her mind. She stood up. Good night, Alexander. There'll be only your washing things in pajamas to put in in the morning. Good night. Good night, said Alexander. She slid down in bed, laid his head on the pillow, closed his eyes, giving a perfect picture of a sleeping angel, and was immediately asleep. This episode, we have talked about Cedric. 同埋 Emma 嘅口供啦 ，Cedric 嘅口供都係唔足以洗除佢嘅嫌疑啦。再之後啦，就係、是、呢個小主人啦 ，Alexander 啦，又同呢個 Lucy 傾偈啦。咁又咁又亦都有提到呢個 Brian 咧，佢爸爸咧就係、是、都係生活有啲好似有啲唔檢點喎，都有好多女人喎，不過都係啲唔三唔四嘅女人咁啦。即係如果如果 Alex 講嘅係屬實啦。咁換句話講咧，即係 Brian 都會唔會係仍然都係有嫌疑咧？咁樣咁啊，似乎都係。咁啊，作者刻意咧就將所有人咧都係疑犯，所有人都係疑犯嚇。咁啊 ，Emma 嗰個口供啊比較上就誒 solid 啲嘅，即係佢有個好清晰嘅時間表啦。咁啊，同好多人一齊食飯啊、做嘢啊呢樣嗰樣啊。咁啊變咗咧，誒要有不在場證據咧，就應該就如果問到佢嘅佢有證人咧，咁啊可以洗脱嫌疑嘅。咁亦都有提到一樣嘢，就係誒 Credit 以為 Alexander 執到嗰封信，只不過係 Lucy 劈低嘅啫，嗰、那個信封啊，純粹係信封。咁啊，只不過係 Lucy 擺落去嚟，當係同啲小朋友玩遊戲，點知唔係喎？啊，唔係喎。唔係 Lucy 擺嘅喎，咁即係話佢哋真係執到喎，咁令到呢個 Credit 咧就覺得呢一封信係咪真係係俾呢個 Maxine 嘅咧？嚇 ，Maxine 真係嚟過呢一度咧？誒 ，Maxine 嚟過呢度打開咗封信咧？咁樣，咁啊，似乎就係想咁引導讀者去咁樣嘅推測啦。OK， 咁啊，讀到呢度先啦，兩個字同大家分享 ，unprop，unprop。咁文中喺前開頭咧，冇耐就講阿 Brian 咧，就話佢 unprop himself from the dresser， 即係話咧佢其實即係 remove 嘅意思啦，即係話佢離開啦咁樣。我一個咧常見字嚟嘅 imperative，imperative 就係餐前走咯，就係、是、咁簡單。OK， 講到呢度啦，今日咁我哋聽日再繼續二十節 four fifty from Paddington。